Section 1. In this section, you will hear a conversation between two students about the installation of a telephone. You have half a minute to read the questions first. Now listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. I buy a new telephone. You read the instructions and I will install it, right? Sure. First, push the battery door outward to open and then insert two batteries, size AAA. Make sure they are following the polarity directions indicated inside the battery compartment. Finally, close the battery door. This is the first step. Now, let's come to the second step, adjusting time. Press time key first, then press MRC key more than one second to enter the time, adjusting state. Have you seen the second digit flashing now? Yes, it is flashing now. So, let's go on. Press MRC key again to adjust minute hour date. Have you finished? Yes, all the digits have been flashing successively. Now it comes to adjusting alarm. Press alarm key to enter the three states of A1, A2, A3. Pay attention to the two keys in the corner on the right hand. They are the keys to lock and unlock the alarm respectively. Press MRC key to enter the adjusting procedure. And have you seen the second digit begin to flash? Yes, I think I should repeat this action, yes? Yes. Press MRC key again to adjust minute and the on-off of the alarm. By now you own a phone at the same time with a clock that can wake you up in the early morning. That's the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 of your listening question booklet. Section 2 You will hear Inspector Jack Dunn talking about international driver's licenses at an information session for international travellers. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. Before you listen, Look at questions 11 to 16. I'm sure that you have all heard about international driving licenses. They have been around since 1949, when the United Nations gave approval for their use. This meant that travellers could drive freely in the 186 countries that recognise the international driving licence system, regardless of the language that the drivers spoke. The only conditions were that the driver had to already hold a driving licence in their home country and they had to be at least 18 years of age. International drivers' licences are well recognised. After all, they've been in use for over 50 years. To break the language barrier, the license is printed in 11 different languages, but the last page of the booklet is always in French. As I said, it is a booklet about the size of a passport, um, 10.8 by 15.25 centimetres to be exact, so it is easy to carry with your travel documents. It's not too thick or heavy either, only 17 pages. All of the pages are coloured white, but the cover of the licence is grey. It is a useful form of identification when you travel because it includes a passport-sized photograph 
and the driver's signature. The international driver's license can only be purchased from authorised travel associations in different countries, but it can also be ordered on the internet. The cost, of course, varies from country to country and for the term or the duration of the license. For example, a one-year license might cost approximately $40, whereas a three-year license costs double that. A five-year license will set you back about $100. Before the final part of the talk, look at questions 17 to 20. Now you will hear the rest of the talk. Answer questions 17 to 20. Before I outline the four most important points to consider, before rushing off to get your international driver's license, I should probably mention that, yes, the international driver's license covers all types of vehicles from motorbikes to trucks. But just as in your own country, you have to be qualified to drive such vehicles. You might like the idea of driving around the Australian outback on a motorbike or checking out the English countryside in a bus with all your mates, but you'll have to take the appropriate test before you set off. OK, now the four main points. Firstly, you cannot use an international license in the country in which it is issued. It is for international travel only. Some international students avoid this rule by ordering their licenses on the internet, which will ask them to nominate a country of your choice for that very purpose. Secondly, some countries won't allow you to use an international license indefinitely. In Australia, for example, you can only use the international license for a year. After that, you must get an Australian driving license. Other countries aren't as strict as that. Thirdly, drivers on international licenses must abide by the road rules in the country that they are visiting. If you are caught breaking those road rules, you will have to pay the penalty usually a fine. And if you are the cause of an accident, expect to pay for any damages that you are responsible for. Holding an international driver's license does not give you the right to be reckless. And yes, if you have been suspended or banned from driving in your own country, the same rules apply with an international driver's license. You must have an existing driver's license to apply for an international driver's license. Some police will, in fact, want to see both your international license and your own driver's license. So carry both licenses with you to save wasting valuable time. Finally, you don't have to take another driving test to get an international driver's license. Your own driver's license is proof that you know how to drive. However, it is your responsibility to learn the road rules of the country that you are visiting and to understand what the different road signs mean. Police are not always understanding to foreign drivers. If you break road rules either deliberately or out of ignorance, expect to pay the price. <clears throat> Police are ultimately the same everywhere. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between Helen and her tutor. First, you have some time to read questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation 
and answer questions 21 to 30. Come in. Ah, it's you, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, it's about that essay on non-verbal communication. I'd like a bit of advice, if that's all right. By all means. That's what I'm here for. How can I help you? Um, it's about that survey you asked us to carry out about body language. Oh, yes. I asked you to investigate what sort of touching is permissible between friends of the same sex and friends of the opposite sex. That's it. And then you wanted us to go on to compare the answers we obtained from people from our own culture with the answers of people from other cultures. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult. There are students here from dozens of cultures, including Asia and the Middle East. Go and ask them. That's the problem. I'm not sure how to word the questions. I think I've got far too many. People don't want to be bothered answering them all. Is that the list of questions you have with you? Let's have a look. Hmm, I see. Your basic idea is fine. You've got a checklist of the parts of the body we mostly use to touch people with and a checklist of the parts of other people's bodies that we usually touch. But you don't have to go right through the list asking a separate question about each item. You can make your questionnaire much shorter if you ask open questions. Open questions? What are they? Sometimes we call them WH questions. What, when, where. Those are examples. Oh, I see. Yes. We learned about them in grammar. I hadn't realised how useful they turn out to be. I could just ask one open question about each subject and tick the answers I receive. That's right. Now, let's have a look at the list of parts of the body you're going to ask about. Um, I see. You've got the head, arm and hand and, oh, it's over the page, the back, leg and foot. What about the shoulder and the thigh? They're important areas, and there are some others you should include too. Oh yes, of course. I was in a rush and forgot those. Um, what about asking people how they feel about being touched? Surely, it's hard for people to put that sort of feeling into words. Yes, you're right. That's why it's essential to work out a rating scale for each response. Can you tell me a bit about how to use rating scales? Well, there's no way to measure how strongly a person feels about something, of course. All we can go on is what they report about their feelings. So what we do is offering them choices of ways to express how they feel. Very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That would be an example of a rating scale. In this case, as your survey is only a small trial sample, I suggest you use that three-point rating scale I've just described. Very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That'll be enough to enable you to draw some broad conclusions. You may go on to refine your survey later if you decide to specialise in the study of non-verbal aspects of behaviour. Thank you. I'm much clearer now. Could I ask you one last question? I'm afraid I've got a brain like a sieve, but I just can't remember the technical term you told us for the study of touch. It sounded like happy, but of course it isn't. Oh, you mean haptics. H-A-P-T-I-C-S. Of course, haptics. That's it. Happy to be of service. That is the end of section three. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture giving advice on how to present a seminar paper. First read questions 31 to 40. Complete the notes of the outline. Write no more than three words in each answer.
In this talk, I'm going to give some advice on how to present a seminar paper. At one time, most university teaching took the form of giving formal lectures. Nowadays, many university teachers try to involve their students more actively in the learning process. One of the ways in which this is done is by conducting seminars. In a seminar, what usually happens is this. One student is chosen to give his ideas on a certain topic. These ideas are then discussed by the other students, the participants in the seminar. What I'd like to discuss with you today is the techniques of presenting a paper at a seminar. As you know, there are two main stages involved in this. One is the preparation stage, which involves researching and writing up a topic. The other stage is the presentation stage, when you actually present the paper to your audience. It is this second stage that I am now concerned with. Let us therefore imagine that you have been asked to lead off a seminar discussion and that you have done all the necessary preparation. In other words, you have done the research and you have written it up. How are you going to present it? There are two ways in which this can be done. The first method is to circulate copies of the paper in advance to all the participants. This gives them time to read it before the seminar so that they can come already prepared with their own ideas about what you have written. The second method is where there is no time for previous circulation or there is some other reason why the paper cannot be circulated. In that case, of course, the paper will have to be read aloud to the group who will probably make their own notes on it while they are listening. In this talk, I am going to concentrate on the first method where the paper is circulated in advance, as this is a most efficient way of conducting a seminar. But most of what I am going to say also applies to the second method, and indeed may be useful to remember any time you have to speak in public. You will probably be expected to introduce your paper even if it has been circulated beforehand. There are two good reasons for this. One is that the participants may have read the paper but forgotten some of the main points. The second reason is that some of the participants may not in fact have had time to read your paper, although they may have glanced through it quickly. They will therefore not be in a position to comment on it unless they get some idea of what it is all about. When you are introducing your paper, what you must not do is simply read the whole paper aloud. This is because, firstly, if the paper is a fairly long one, there may not be enough time for discussion. From your point of view, the discussion is the most important thing. It is very helpful for you if other people criticise your work. In that way, you can improve it. Secondly, a lot of information can be understood when one is reading. It is not so easy to pick up detailed information when one is listening. In other words, there may be a lack of comprehension or understanding. Thirdly, it can be very boring listening to something being read aloud. Anyway, some of your audience may have read your paper carefully and will not thank you for having to go through all of it again. Therefore, what you must do is follow the following nine points. 1. Decide on a time limit for your talk. Tell the audience what it is. Stick to your time limit. This is very important. 2. Write out your spoken presentation in the way that you intend to say it. This means that you must do some of the work of writing the paper again, in a sense. You may think that this is a waste of time, but it isn't. If a speaker tries to make a summary of his paper while he is standing in front of his audience, the results are usually disastrous. 3. Concentrate only on the main points. Ignore details. Hammer home the essence of your argument. If necessary, find ways of making your basic points so that your audience will be clear about what they are. 4. Try to make your spoken presentation lively and interesting. This doesn't necessarily mean telling jokes and anecdotes. But if you can, think of interesting or amusing examples to illustrate your argument. Use them. 5. If you are not used to speaking in public, write out everything you have to say, including example etc. 
Rehearse what you are going to say until you are word perfect. 6. When you know exactly what you are going to say, reduce it to outline notes. Rehearse your talk again, this time from the outline notes. Make sure you can find your way easily from the outline notes to the full notes, in case you forget something. 7. At the seminar, speak from the outline notes, but bring both sets of notes and your original paper to the meeting. Knowing that you have a full set of notes available will be good for your self-confidence. 8. Look at your audience while you are speaking. The technique to use is this. First, read the appropriate parts of your notes silently. If you are using outline notes, this won't take long. Then, look up at your audience and say what you have to say. Never speak while you are still reading. While you are looking at your audience, try to judge what they are thinking. Are they following you? You will never make contact with your audience if your eyes are fixed on the paper in front of you. 9. Make a strong ending. One good way of doing this is to repeat your main points briefly and invite questions or comments. Perhaps I can sum up by saying this. Remember that listening is very different from reading. Something that is going to be listened to has therefore got to be prepared in a different way from something that is intended to be read. That is the end of section four. You will have half a minute to check your answers.